The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. In Hebrews 10, we're looking at 32 through 39, but tonight we're, we're what I've done is I've broken this down into two sections. <laughs> you remember, we're in the fourth warning. In the book of Hebrews, there are five warnings given about the, about the same subject. New covenant believers going back to old covenant belief system. <clears throat> and warnings are given because they're in the fourth cycle already, Israel. Why would you go back to it knowing that they crucified their Messiah and headed for the fifth? And so I'm looking at 32, 33, 34 tonight. <clears throat> he and remember, they've just come off talking about it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And we covered that under the, under the five cycles. This, this fourth warning starts way up there about 25 and runs through 30, 39. Actually, when we get through 39, we'll be done with our study in the book of Hebrews, which didn't take too long. Remember the former days when after, that's very important, remember the former days, now that's to these people who came out of the old covenant system. These are Jewish believers who come out of the old covenant system through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, believing that it was he, that Jesus of Nazareth, that was the Christ who died for their sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And these re referring to the former days, and you'll see in that section of the former days, it's from the point of their salvation to what they've gone through up to now. Looking back to the former days, they're not looking back to way beyond it, but how they were saved out of that law because the law pointed them to Christ and they had the good sense to see Christ as the Messiah and the Savior of the world and believe that. And so this is what he's talking about. there. But remember the former days, when after, see, now that's very important. When after being enlightened, in other words, that's saved and in the doctrine of undeserved suffering and, and listen, would have gone through with them the same stuff I did with you, five cycles of di divine discipline upon Israel, what the fifth is going to meet. Listen, the fifth is going to be terrible, wasn't it? I mean, you, we saw the people go through the fifth lose their humanity. And, I mean, that takes a lot to get people. These people never would have believed it. Well, anyhow, when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering. After, listen, God never puts suffering on you that he hasn't in, given you a, enlightenment about it beforehand. That is teaching you the truth of the word of God categorically. In this, in this regard, Undeserved suffering connected with the angelic conflict and the five cycles of divine discipline upon the priest nation of Israel uh, who just murdered their Messiah. And they did it willfully from the top up. It wasn't that they didn't know what they were doing. So you endured a great, a great comp in the former days from the point of their salvation up to now, which is about 30 some years. That's all right. I know you just wanted to sing a song. You said, I know. <laughs> Didn't I know that? Uh, you endured a great conflict of suffering. Now watch, he's going to describe what they went through. Partly by being made a public spectacle, spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers were those who were so treated. Now, I don't know what you think you know about that, but that's taking everything they have, including their job. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners that they put them in jail for believing in Christ, the Christian faith, right? I mean, that's the book of Acts. And watch this. You, 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 
partly by being a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, partly becoming identified publicly with those who were so treated the same way. You showed sympathy to the prisoners for the cause of Christ. Watch this. And accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. And, and listen, I mean, they took everything. They seized all of your wealth. When they talk about property, they're talking about wealth. They took everything. They took everything. And listen, this group of people did what? What did they do? When, when the government came in and, ex, and, and seized everything they had, took everything from them, everything from them. Now, believe it or not, this stuff still goes on today. In many countries, this kind of behavior still goes on. But look, what, how, the, look how the people joyfully, they accepted it joyfully. This is why you come to Bible study, so you can be prepared when something like this rolls over into your life, you can do what? Accept it joyfully. And how did they accept it joyfully? Knowing that you have for yourself a better position, a possession, and a lasting one. You, you, knowing, you know, how did they, well, listen, they were taught the word of God. Faith comes from what? There'll come a day when you would have longed for the day you have today to have the freedom to get in your car and come down to Bible study and get the truth. When everything is seized from you, no more cars, no more trucks, no more nothing, not even a house, seized your entire wealth accumulation. These people were doing that to their own people. It's no wonder they got the fifth. They're not doing this. To, they're doing this to their own people. Most, most nations that do this, do this to their own people. So that's where we're going tonight. And what I did is I took this last passage. I broke it down into two parts. Notice at the very top of your paper, and then we'll have, a, we'll have prayer. I took verses 32 to 39, which is our final section of the fourth warning. I broke it in two sections. Remember, we are still in the fourth warning in the book of Hebrews. That's important. These Jewish believers were deserting the New Testament teachings of Christ and going back to a system that was absolutely brutal. They went back to that system to the, with these people. And they thought, these people come in and took these people everything they had. They thought if they were back with them and joined up with them, maybe they could get some of it back. You think they're going to give it back? What does the government ever give you anything back? Well, we're just going to have a little tax to raise some money to, to do something, and we'll only be for a year, and we'll be able to get enough money after a year. Shoot. It's forever, isn't it? Corrupt people. Just corrupt isn't that the truth? That couldn't have said better, Sam. It goes all the way down to us, doesn't it? Well, there you go. The Jewish believers were deserting. And so he reminds them that they have gone through this before with these people. That's a continuous thing. This is not just a one-time thing. This is the way these people behave. And so he goes into that, and what he says, remember the for, former days, he's talking from 30 A.D. when Christ was crucified to mid-60s now, right? Because remember the book is written somewhere around 64, and so that's where we are. And listen, he gives this, and six years later, they're going to go under the fifth cycle to Rome in 70 A.D., which we've talked about in great lengths. And, and the phrase you want to remember from this when after being enlightening, enlightened, after, when after being enlightened, 
That's why you come to Bible study. God always gives the spiritually advancing believer a heads up. He always gives you a preview of coming attractions. You're going to lay it out there doctrinally. Pastor is going to try to show that from every angle of the word of God. Many times illustrate it so that you don't miss it. And the only way you'll miss it is not pay attention in class. And then when the snowball rolls into your yard where you have to deal with it, be sure that you know how to deal with it because you've been taught how to deal with it so you could do what? Accept it joyfully. Accept it joyfully. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Give you a moment of silence. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. That is our subject, certainly. It is a subject every night we teach. You can't study it in carnality, nor can you live it. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue, or vert sins. So the, the, what do I do? Well, you have to confess your sin. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. What's that do for me? It puts me back into fellowship with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, you're now, you're no longer carnal, you're spiritual, and now God can deal with you both on the learning and the living side. And that's the way the Christian life is lived. It's lived in the power of the Spirit, never in the flesh. It's lived by walking by faith that comes by hearing and, and, and receiving and applying the Word of God. So we're thankful for it tonight, Father, for these who have come our way to study with us both by the... By, by way of automobile and by way of internet. I pray that those on the internet would show the same courtesy to the word of God by not being distracted for the next hour. Pay attention. Uh, confess sin and be sure the Holy Spirit is able to teach you truth in the silence of your own inner chamber of inner dialogue where you, where you talk to yourself that maybe you would allow the Holy Spirit to tell you great, great truths. And these truths will set you free, Jesus said in John 8, 32. We're thankful for it tonight, Father, for these. We're thankful to have people interested in the word of God at Tuesday night Bible study in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Listen, look what he talks about. Great. Now, we all know when something's great, I suppose. You know, great is somebody's got to tell you, here's the conflict of suffering. Great is a way of magnifying, isn't it? Isn't it? And it's a language of, of it's common language, don't you think? I mean, people say, you know, I've got a great job. A guy told me the other day, I said, hey, did you finally get a job? He said, yeah, boy, I got a great job. And we, I knew what he meant by that. You know, I knew what he meant by that. When I talk to my grandson, and he says, I say to him, "How did? How, what kind of a ball game did you have the other night, son?" And he said, "I had a great one. We lost, but I had a great game." I know what he means. And I say to him, "Can you accept your defeat? Can you, def you know, can you accept it joyfully?" He said, "Maybe tomorrow." <laughs> I said, "But well, that." I understand that. I never wanted anybody to talk to me after Friday. I might by maybe by Sunday, I was ready to have a conversation about the ball game. Great, and here's what he calls it. He calls it a great conflict of suffering for Christ. A great conflict of suffering. Now, a lot of us has, have had suffering in our life. And maybe we've even might have called it at some point in our life great. By comparison to something else, maybe it wouldn't be as great as you think it is if you compared it to somebody else that says, well, let me tell you what I went through. And you go like, oh, wow. <sighs> maybe mine. But when we use the word great, now here's a word great that's not used in our own vernacular of our life. You know, it's great until something other comes along then it's, Great, but 
this is the one God says it's great. When he says a great conflict of suffering, that's, I mean, that's got to be pretty tough. Wouldn't you agree? When God calls it great, it's got to be tough. A great conflict of suffering for Christ is, is a reference. And listen, and they're in it. And listen, we're in it too. Because what they're in is the intensity, the intensification of the angelic conflict. And he tells you when it started. Started in 30 AD. It was, all, it was going on until the 60. It's still going on in 2018. And it doesn't matter where you live in the world. If you live for Christ, the Bible says all of those who desire to live a godly life will be what? Persecuted. No matter where you live. I mean, the God of this world is, going, is, is, is out to wretch up the game on you. And God is going to let him wretch it up to as much as he's taught you. Because it's an exercise of your faith. Why do you think you're going to learn the word of God if you're not going to get tested with it to bring it out and to bring it out in the open where you can glorify God to see him do the things that he promised to do in Romans 4.21. God is able to do, he's able to perform what he's promised. The, the, you get to promise, you get to performance. The performance is not that God is trying to do something bad to you. Is that he's trying to do something good to you. He's trying to get you out of yourself and into the plan of God where God does what he's promised. He's not asking you to do what he promised you. He's asking you to trust him to do what he promised to do for you. You look everywhere in the world except where you should be looking. You're looking, well, if I could get a hand out here and if I could get a hand up here and if I could get this, I could get that. Listen, you already got it in Christ. You're looking at all the wrong places. You've got to learn to stop doing that. You've got to start trusting God to do what he promised in your life and then find the glory in it. And you've got to learn to accept this stuff. And, you know, it'd be well worth your time to read 1 Peter 5 where he tells you how this exercise works. I mean, it's... But we live in the intensification. You know why? You know why we live in the intensification. Listen, we all live in the intensification of the angelic conflict. It has it started in 30 A.D. when he was able to murder him. Right? Got a bunch of people, which, which you know, God allowed all that, right? So that redemption could come by grace and not through not through any other system on the historical standpoint. Listen, people were always saved by grace through faith and not of themselves was the gift of God. But it was done in the Old Testament. In the Old Covenant, it was done by prophecy, the prophetic gospel. Listen, you know that if you read Galatians 3.8, how, how was Abraham saved? By the gospel. Well, anyhow, the intensification of the angelic conflict started in the first coming of Christ, and it's going to run all the way to the second. I said the intensification of the angelic conflict. I need to say the angelic conflict. You know why it is? Because we live, live in the what? Last days. We live in the last days. This is the last days. When Christ comes back, he rolls it all up. It's all rolled up when Christ returns. We live in the last days. You know what we're headed for? The new ones. How good is that? Now, the last days, Hebrews 1, 2 would tell you that. We talked about it in Hebrews 9, 26, when he called it the consummation of the ages. He calls it the consummation of the ages. Uh, 1 Peter, listen to this. In 1 Peter 1, that's not far away from where we are in Hebrews, at 20, I'm looking at 2021 20, here. He says, 12021. 20, watch it, watch it. There are a couple words here really important. We we sometimes miss them because we we hear it, we don't think we know what it means, but we should because it's a simple word. He says in, in, in verse 20, for he, which is the Lamb of God who shed his blood, right? In verse 19. I'm in 1 Peter 1, 20. I just made a reference to the who he, the, the he is in, a, K, 
capital letters. See? And it's a reference to the Lamb of God that came, you know, in the blood of the Lamb business. For he, Christ, was foreknown. That's to know something beforehand. It's not complicated. Everybody gets theologically with it. Go, oh, I wish I knew what that meant. It just means to know something beforehand. And, and before what? Christ, as the Lamb of God, whose blood would bring redemption, was known before what? The, listen, it, the prophetic principle was already established and later written in the Word of God that you and I have in our possession. <laughs> he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. But what's the second word that's important? But has appeared. Appeared. What's that? He who was foreknown before the creation of the worlds, the universe business. Right? Before the foundation of the world. But has appeared. That's historical. Listen, appeared where? In the foundation of the world, in the world, in the foundation. He was known about all, all the stuff that we got was already laid out in the divine plan of God. Foreknown before the creation of the world, the creation of the world is in. And in 5 BC, he appears. Historically, he appears to the world. The, the foundation of the world, the world, the founding of the world. He comes to the founding of the world in 5 B.C. As what? John said, behold, the Lamb of God has come to take away the sin of the world. Now, how is he going to do that? The blood. Nothing but the blood. And when was this foreknown? <laughs> Do you realize how old the word of God and how true the word of God is that you possess? Do you realize that tonight? I, I, every once in a while, you get some rookie theologian who's got his PhD and he ain't got his head screwed on right that want to debate about the origin of the word of God. All they need to go to the word of God to tell you. Listen, listen, the word of God is older than dirt. You got that one? <laughs> How about that? That's old, buddy. Because it was foreknown before dirt. That's how I see it. But I'm just a farm boy. What do I know? King James says manifest. Yeah, physically manifested. Yeah, sure. Revealed. As long as we know what we're talking about, I don't care what the word is. All right, but you're right. Revealed, appeared, manifested. These are all good. These are all good. But has appeared when? Third, third important thing in these what? Last times. And he's talking about the chronological times. When I say they was born in five A.B., what he's talking about is the chronological times from the foundation of the world till we get up to when he came, which we know is five B.C. It's a chronological end of time. And now we're at the last part. Here's the foundation of the world when time is chronologically gone. You know, we call them periods. And here we are. We're in the last. Why? Because we're the, we, we, the last for the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ is the last. And who, in this chronological is of ages since the foundation of the world, where, where, where do you and I live? The last. We're in the omega. We're not in the alpha. Our, our, our great father was, though, you know, with a little g, Adam. You know, like glued third chapter. I mean, where, where did we come from? Well, we came from the dirt. Right? You know, people called me a dirt ball. I said, geez, you must study the Bible. You, got to, you finally got one right in our whole conversation. You finally got one right. <laughs> I, couldn't be, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> Why would we argue? I don't want to fight you. I agree with you. 
Today's, today's text, I want to put a theme to it. Now, my text, my, my lesson title, Great Conflict of Suffering coming out of my text. But here's, here's my theme of it. Only one backup plan. I wish Ed Jones was here tonight because he's always talking about me to me about a backup plan. Financial advisors, that's the way they think. Let me tell you, there is only one. There is only one true backup plan. And these people that we're talking to, to about tonight learned that. I hope you don't have to learn it. I hope. Because it's a trying time to go through when you lose everything you have accumulated in your life. Maybe even, even your people. All, when you lose all of your details of life. And we'll never get them back. The odds of getting them back when you live in the last days. Not likely. And listen, for the people who lose them, they should accept it how? Now, buddy, you're going to have to have some word from God on that deal, aren't you? And that's why I'm your teacher. I'm going to give that to you. Because this could come to your life because we live in the last days. This, this, is, this is how the last days look. We're in the intensification of the angelic conflict because the devil knows his time's up. Were you just stretching? No, I had a question. What? No, I'm saying. <laughs> I'm saying when they come, they will take everything from you, whether you, whether you give it up willfully or don't. Well, they did. This is what these people are going through. There are people in the world today that this, this is common. And listen, not too far, not too far geographically from where we live. I mean, where do you think all this caravan, what do you think most of these people are fleeing from to? Right? I mean, much of it, much of it's poverty. Where does that come from? I mean, this is what these people do down there. Only one backup plan, All right? Some, some new, new covenant Jewish believers engaged in, engaged in this great conflict of suffering have grown weary of it. They shouldn't. And listen, when you grow weary of what God has put on your plate as a spiritual mature believer, and you guys are, listen, when he puts stuff on your plate, you must not grow weary of it. You must accept it how? Ah, I see. Yeah. It, it's easy to it's easy to say, give me a J, give me an O, give me a, when everything is going hunky dory. You know. Rick goes overseas on a mission trip and he's about to go in December again. And, Everything comes out health-wise for him. And we pray that it will. <coughs> People travel for miles by foot. Sleep on the ground. This pastor wrote him about the number of people coming in. Listen, the numbers... could be, I mean, the numbers could get so crazy you couldn't handle it apart from God's grace, just like the feeding of the 5,000. When, when, you, when you step into the grace of God, the grace of God, but listen, you must always remember that God takes care of the grace problem. That's why it's called grace. These people travel 
They travel, they travel by foot, no matter what the weather is, doesn't matter if they have a storm or not. These people, if they've got a man in there teaching the word of God, they ain't in Bibles. They don't have Bibles. They got a man teaching the word of God. They travel all that way. They sleep on floors. They 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 feed them for a buck a day or something, Rick. What? They feed, they feed them un and listen, they they if if they can give this guy a mat to keep him off the cold ground and give him some type of blanket, this guy thinks he's in a five-star hotel. And they're in terrible conditions. And the one bright hope that they find is that when they get in and study the word of God, God gives them hope for today and tomorrow. It encourages their heart. Because they live in cultures that have done this very thing to them. And because of Christ in their life, they have found the things in life that are truly valuable when you have nothing else. And God has put these people as a bright light to us. They have nothing. Yet they have more hope through Christ than you could possibly imagine. If I could get you to put that much hope in your life and you have everything, you have everything essential to life. All of the essentials to life you have and more. You've got a flushing toilet. A flushing toilet. Yeah, you, can, you can freeze stuff. You have refrigerators and all this stuff. So I'm going to give you a passage. <clears throat> you must never become weary. We live in the last days. We're in the angelic conflict. <clears throat> and in the angelic conflict, in the intensification of the angelic conflict, our light really shines brightest when we're in the midst of the conflict. When the, when the, when it, the greater the conflict of suffering for Christ, the greater the light and the glory to God. The greater the light and the glory to God. Listen, if you don't believe that, you should study the book of Acts. And listen, the conflict followed them because of the intensification. When they left, everywhere the church went, no matter what, if they went to Ephesus, if they went to Corinth, if they went to Rome, if they went to Spain, wherever they went, the conflict went with them. Why? Because of, because of the devil, the intensification of the angelic conflict. You know, when you read, when you read the, the upper room discourse, if you, the Last Supper, if you read the Last Supper discourse of Christ, he talks about the God of this world, Satan, is our adversary. Well, anyhow, uh, here, here is a couple points. My introduction has gone a long time. Here, oh, I, here's the verse I want you to write down. I want you to write this down because I don't want you to grow weary. There's no reason to ever grow weary. I don't care what he puts on your plate. I don't care what he puts on your plate. Here's the passage. Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He says, all who come to me. Right? Weary. Come to me. All ye, come to me. Come to me, babies. Come to me. All you are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you for your soul. My yoke, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. But listen, you know what's important? You got to come to Jesus. Children, come to Jesus. Children, come to Jesus. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will put rest in your soul. I will lift your burdens. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a savior who lifts burdens. The ones I give you are light. So stop, stop putting them on yourself. The burdens you have that I give you are what? 
light. My yoke is easy, burdens light. Yeah, he said that's what exactly what he says. Cast your cares in Peter, First Peter. So, I want you to put that down there because these people they got weary of the conflict. It was a great conflict, and they got weary in it. So they thought if they ran away from it, that somehow it would be lessened. It just got greater. Listen, you never run from Christ. What did he say to you? Come to me. Come to me. What are you running from? Come back here. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Point one, our theme, only one backup plan, emphasizes the importance of spiritual growth maturity to be able to come to a place in your life where you understand the difference between despair over temporal losses of details and the joy of the eternal gain of the worthiness of suffering for Christ. Think about that. That's the only way you're going to be able to accept this joyfully. Accept it joyfully. Listen, here's one. I don't think it's on your paper. It could be, but it's probably not. Because I didn't, I wrote 2126, and that's a good one, but 19 sets it up. Philippians 119. You know what he says? He says, it's been granted you not only to believe, but what? To suffer for me. Not only to believe in me, but to suffer for me. Now, don't, listen, it has been granted. This is normal life. Granted is normal life for us. It's been granted for you to believe in Christ and to suffer for him. And, and listen, you know, everybody, I heard somebody on my, before I left, the, they, they talked about a grant. They had got a grant of a million dollars. They got a grant. They were so excited. I thought, me too. I've got a grant. I got a grant from God to believe in Christ and to suffer for his name. Hallelujah. And there will be a crown of life waiting for me when I, when I touch in the next life. Right, Mama? You know what Philippians 121 says? I know that. Therefore, for me to live is and to die is. Gain. See, it's all. Listen, everything about Christ is gain. There are no losses in Christ. There's only gain. Whatever the world takes from you, whether no matter what they take from you, they can't take what they can never take from you what is gain. They can never take Christ away from you. They can take eternal life from you. They can't do any of that. The word of God in your soul, they can't take from you. They can't take it from you. That's why the word of God needs to be in your soul. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Listen, everything about Christ is gain. In 1 Peter 4:16, he talks about suffering as Christians. That's interesting to have that in the Bible. It uses the word Christian. Suffering as Christians. Listen, here's Philippians 3, 7. I wrote down your paper. Whatever things, whatever things. You know, when you see it, that hurricanes go through and the, and the people lose everything, you know, some of the most valued things they lost and they weep over? Memories. They lose pictures and things from history, from family passed down. Generational things. They, they weep over that. The other things is like, okay, that's the, but how can I ever, I can replace a house, I can place a window, a, an easy chair, a, you know, clothes. For generations. I mean, this stuff has been passed on him, the oldest child. One lady said, this has been passed on from our ancestry to us. I was the last. And now I, you know, I can't keep it and pass it on to my child. 
and it's all gone. You know, I wanted to say to her, I know, I know that's a loss. Can you accept it joyfully? It is a loss. I'm not, can't belittle a loss on it. The loss is real. The, the suffering and the pain about that loss. I mean, you can see it in this dear late old lady's heart. I mean, but can you, listen, can't do nothing about the loss now, but can you accept it joyfully? Can you accept it joyfully? The same way you did with, I lost my car, but I can replace it. I lost my house, but I can replace it. I lost my clothes, but I can replace Are there those things in your life? That, and that, that's called accepting it joyfully. And I know this is a greater conflict. This is a greater conflict over here that you have, but can you accept it joyfully? I'm not saying you have to do it today, but I'm saying you've got to. <laughs> Could get, you got to have the same joy. I mean, the joy. I can replace this. I can replace that. I'm okay. I don't care. <laughs> okay. See, I know. I know. That's because this is greater than that. But in, even in greater conflict, he said, even in the greatest of conflict, accept it joyfully because it, it's better for you, isn't it? I mean, she had no problem with this over here. She, had, she was in despair over here. See, she, you can find balance in that. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to diminish this. I mean, it's a, gr a great loss is a great loss. But in that midst of that great loss, the Bible says accept it joyfully because you need to have balance in your life about things because you're not, your roots are not here. Your roots are in heaven. I'm, I'm talking to believers now. Our roots are in heaven. Whatever things were gained, details of life, to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. You notice it wasn't for my sake because we couldn't do it, but we do it for his sake. And I find that really interesting. And I find, you know, when you ought to start making your list, now. You know where you ought to come to this resolution in your life? Now. That's what he told you, knowing. Remember that? Knowing. Knowing. Listen, when he says in the very next passage, you accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing. See, that's ganasco in a present active participle. Present tense means this is, this is a belief that is steadfast. Doesn't matter, what, doesn't matter what the wind blows in or blows out. I'm in the present tense of what I know. What I know, I know. Okay? And that's, that, that's because you've been doctrinally taught. You don't get there without that. That's the word knowing. People say to me all the time, they sit in a class like this and say, I've never heard this ever. I've never heard this before. You know why? Listen to me. This is important. Don't put who on, the, don't put who on other people. You know why you've never learned this before? Because you weren't ready. Or else you'd have been here a year ago. You'd have been here five years ago. I've been here 44. See, it's about knowing it and the point in your life when you're ready to sit down and learn some things. That's the word knowing. Ganasco means you've been, you've been doctrinally taught. You got a senator to Paul to know what Paul teaches. You got a senator to Peter to know what he teaches. You got a senator to Ron to know what he teaches. And listen, I teach the word of God. I make you, I make you bring your Bible, we open it up, and we study the word of God here. And so... This is, this is really important. You accept joyfully the seizure of your property knowing, see, joyfully. Listen, you can't have that joyful acceptance if you don't have the knowledge of what God has taught you about it. And that's what he's saying. Knowing, knowing that you have for yourself a better possession that you've lost the temporal, but you've gained the eternal. And you know how you did that? And listen, you can find that balance. The balance is in knowing that my losses that are attached to the earth are not as great as the ones that have been laid up in heaven in my name. The, the ones I have in my name on earth that are losses are temporal, but those laid up in heaven in my name are eternal. 
and therefore I can accept this balance. Please tell me you understand that. Please tell me you understand that or you're going to have some rough days. That you have for yourself a better, 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 better. See, that's, a, that's a, how did I get that? How did I get that better? By knowing, by being doctrinally taught. No excuse when you walk out of here tonight. A better possession and what? A lasting one, eternal one. How about that? See, that's laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. See that word joyful? Let me go back to that moment. God, I'm never going to get through this tonight anyhow. See the word joy, but I'm going to try to quit on time. Joyfully. Joyfully. All of a sudden, the hurricane comes through, and you've lost a lot of really precious things to you. Maybe, maybe even family members, maybe pets, you know, and, and history and things that are, quote, irreplaceable to you in that moment. And you have this idea, well, some of these are and some aren't. And so you're caught in this place that I just mentioned to you about in uh, this idea. But look, and, and the word is joyful, right? Accept it what? Joyfully. joyfully. Accept it joyfully. Now, in the moment it hits, whoosh, hurricane blows through, whoosh, and we survived. That was rough enough in itself. And then you evaluate. I mean, the seizure of your, of your, you've lost your stuff. Now there's an event. Count it, right? Listen, immediately, here's what God has provided for you. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit, listen, listen to the first three. This is instantaneous, up front, and full, full blown. When he says, I will give you love, he gives it to you 100%, 100% of love, 100% of the time, and 100% of the need. It's done by the Holy Spirit of God. It's not done in your flesh. It's not done in your growth. It's done because none of that can be called to your attention because you are devastated. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ in that moment of devastation. Turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and let the Holy Spirit produce in you love, joy, and Peace, that's the three front burners, three front burners on your, on your stove. Right there, you got it. And there's the word, what? Joy. 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 It's given to you instantaneous, 100%, 100%, 100%. 100% of, of, of joy, 100% of, of the need, 100% that God will supply it exactly full-blown 100% joy. It won't be 20% joy. It won't be 30% joy. It'll be the mother load. Boom. You get it instantaneously. The fruit of the what? Come on now. Where's the Holy Spirit live? Inside my body. For how long? Forever, John 14, 16. Forever. There is no reason... In a midst of a storm of life, when you've got these losses mounting up, and it's devastating that you can't step into that place in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and have instantaneous joy so that you can get some kind of level. And when he does it, then he gets into a teaching mode. He will teach and recall doctrines that you have in your soul that will cause you to level out this field, this playing field in your life. You get balance in your life. You got to be able to do that instant. You got to be able. To, you got to be able to do it on your feet in the midst of a storm. You got to be able to do that. You got to know that. But listen, here's the most part. You got to know you can do that. I know I can call upon in this hour. I know I can find balance in my life. I, I am devastated by this, but I know one thing. He's not. I need to get. I need to get in his refuge, where it's warm and comfortable and and calm. <laughs> James, you know what James says? James, the first chapter, verse 2, and you all know this, you just don't know where it's probably, James 1, 2, count it. Joy. 
Oh, no, no. That's not, what you, that's not how you live. Say it again. Count it. All joy. All joy. See, very few of us are willing to do that. We're willing to count some of it joy. Now, I'm, I'm counting what I've lost, and I'm counting, and uh, there's just something I can't accept. Okay? That's not counting it all joy. When you fall into the muck and mire and you sink and over your head. Hey, I see you. I see you. Can you hear me? I see you're in quicksand over your head. Can you hear me? Can you count it all joy? See, I'm not being facetious. I'm telling you the truth. Can you count it all joy? That's truthful. You know what's you know what's interesting? Verse three and four. I, I'm in James one now. <laughs> I'm in James one two. Count it all joy when you fall in muck and mire over your head. Can you still count it all joy? Can you accept it joyfully? You know what three 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 and four three and four goes on, and it says, and do you know what it's producing in you? Endurance. Endurance. How you doing there, Can you still count it all joy? I feel sorry for those people who dropped in tonight on the internet. I'm not normally like this. I'm normally worse. Back to Hebrews 10, 32, when I close this session out tonight. <coughs> Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about this word endurance. <coughs> but remember, I love that word remember. You know what it means? It means recall doctrine, recall truth. Remember. Remember. It's, it's an imperative. It's an imperative. Imperative. It's a command. Remember. That's doctrine recall. That's John 14, 26, people. Remember the former days when after being enlightened, they had the doctrine, God always prepares you ahead of time with the word of God. And look at the word. You endured a great conflict of suffering. You endured. You endured. <laughs> Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about that word. You endured. You know why? Because it dominates the subject of verses 32 through 34, and it also is in 35 through 39, the word endure. You find it a lot in the word of God. Like in, like in James 1, 2 through 4. All right. Well, that's as far as I got tonight. I really knocked that one out of the park, didn't I? Well, we got, listen, what do I know? I just write it down. I never know. I never know. Let's have a word of prayer. We'll let them off the internet, and then we'll have our private prayer time here as a church. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us.